Hello everyone, I am Rashid and today we will discuss about an important topic of modern Indian history and this topic is a very known topic to all of us but we need to know the details of this topic. The topic is the mighty revolt of 1857. Okay? So first of all we need to know what were the major factors that led to this mighty revolt of 1857 then what was the nature or character of this revolt and what were the major reasons that led to the end of this revolt after some time itself clear first of all we need to understand that this mighty revolt of 1857 that took place in the northern and central part of India has been reconstructed initially by official historians clear official historians means British officers who were there in India so obviously British officers tried to downplay the importance of this revolt as they wanted to brand it simply as a sepoy mutiny nothing more than that clear since they wanted to downplay the importance of this revolt we don't have much information about this revolt through literary records we cannot rely totally on official records that is always limited in scope so in course of time when research started to take place on the revolt of 1857 the nationalist school of thought and historians of india they came up with certain logical arguments these arguments also needs to be discussed to have comprehensive knowledge about the mighty revolt of 1857 so one thing i would like to make it clear at the very outset that we don't have any concrete literary records to reconstruct this event it has to be based on certain analysis and certain speculation so nothing can be said with certainty it has to be in terms of perhaps it has to be in terms of chances so with this we'll understand what were the major reasons for this mighty revolt clear this mighty revolt occurred in at Meerut on 10th of may 1857 when sepoys revolted and on the next day they reached delhi to proclaim mughal emperor bahadur shah zafar not only to be the head of indian territory but as well as the nominal head of the mighty revolt of 1857 clear among all the factors related to the revolt of 1857 the most important reason perhaps was the economic policies of the british east india company clear the company being a private trading corporation they tried to exploit indian territory they tried to maximize their profit out of indian territory so they in the in this process they went on exploiting indian resources and masses and that became a primary reason for example british east india company started the process of collecting land revenue from different parts of india and in this process they came up with three different types of land revenue settlements like the permanent settlement in bengal bihar and Odisha, the rayotwari settlement in bombay and madras as well as the mahalwari settlement in the gangetic plain and northwestern part of india the common feature of all these revenue settlements was that they wanted to collect higher land revenue with strictness and rigidity they never took into account the climatic variations as well as they never took into account the natural factors that affected indian agriculture clear that is why they failed to reconcile the peasantry class with collection of land revenue exorbitant land revenue especially in rayotwari settlement and rigid collection in mahalwari and permanent areas led to eviction of peasants from ownership rights that created long-term grievances among the peasantry class this grievances took a sudden outburst in 1857 and peasantry class became prime movers of the mighty revolt of 1857 clear at the same time the trade policies followed by british led to one-sided growth of british economy at the cost of indian resources clear first of all with british industrialization india was converted into supplier of raw materials as well as consumer of finished products clear with this development india was reduced to a colony of britain clear it is a great paradox of human history that when britain was witnessing rapid industrialization india went through the process of de-industrialization in fact india paid price for the revolt of for the mighty development 
development that took place in Britain. All these factors led to long-term grievances among the peasantry class and these grievances resulted into mighty outbreak of revolt in northern and central part of India in 1857. So first primary reason was the economic policies followed by British East India Company. The second major factor that led to this mighty revolt of 1857 was British policy of political and territorial annexation. British authority conquered large parts of Indian territory and in this also they offended and affected the interest of regional rulers of India. Clear? First of all, British authority conquered the province of Bengal, which was the most prosperous province of India. Then they went on to conquer the provinces of Marathas in western part of India, Mysore in the region of South India, Punjab in the northwestern part of India, and finally, in the year 1856, they annexed the province of Awadh in the northern part of India on the flimsy ground of maladministration. Conquest of Awadh is a very important turning point because most of the Sepoys who worked in the British military system, they belonged to Awadh. Their regional sentiments got affected and they wanted to uproot British authority from Indian territory. And therefore, these Sepoys only took initiative to revolt against the British that resulted into mighty revolt of 1857 clear therefore second major factor was political annexation followed by British East India Company the third major factor that led to mighty revolt of 1857 this third major factor was the socio-cultural policies followed by British in India even though British never wanted to interfere into social dynamics of India but under the pressure of British parliamentarians and some Indian reformers, they began to interfere into social life of Indian masses. Clear? They began to enact legislations like abolition of Sati in 1829, widow remarriages in 1856, as well as, uh, as, well as abolition of slavery in 1843. All these seems to be very progressive in nature, but that affected the most dominant sections of Indian society, that is Brahmins and Ulemas, who considered themselves to be custodians of Indian society. Clear? And therefore, they became the torchbearers of mighty revolt of 1857. So, third major policy was socio-cultural approach adopted by British in India. And finally, the last major factor was the religious factor that also turned out to be an immediate factor that led to the outbreak of this revolt. Clear? The immediate factor was introduction of a new weapon among Indian sepoys known as Enfield rifle, clear? And in order to enfield, uh, 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 use this Enfield rifle, British provided certain cartridges to Indian supplies and these cartridges were to be bitten off by mouth before being loaded. But there was a strong news that these cartridges contained the fat of cow and pig which are prohibited to be consumed by both Hinduism and Islam. Since there was a strong news of greased cartridges containing fat of cow and pig, Indian supplies refused to use these weapons and cartridges and when British pressurized them, they revolted against the British that marked the beginning of mighty revolt of 1857. Clear? So this was the immediate factor that is issue of greased cartridges. So four major factors that led to mighty revolt of 1857, these were British policy of economic, economic activities, British approach towards political annexation, socio-cultural approach followed by British and finally issue of greased cartridges in India. Clear? When this revolt began in 1857, it spread all across northern and central parts part of India and there were five major centers of this revolt. Clear? These centers were Delhi, Kanpur, Lucknow, Jhansi and Ara in Bihar. Before we go on to discuss about these major centers, first of all we'll understand what was the basic character or nature of this revolt. Clear? First of all I'll let you know there has been debate among scholars and historians related to the nature or character of this revolt. Clear? As I told you British scholars always wanted to downplay the importance of this revolt and therefore they, civil, they merely characterize it as sepoy mutiny. But at the same time with constant research and evolution, Indian scholars and nationalist scholars have come up to view that this revolt was guided by certain distinctive characteristics. So we'll understand first of all the characteristics, the nature or the major features of mighty revolt of 1857. Clear? After thorough historical research, 
it has been largely accepted that the first major character of the mighty revolt of 1857 was that it lacked sense of modern nationalism. So this point needs to be understood. The first major character of the mighty revolt of 1857 was that this revolt, that this revolt lacked sense of modern nationalism clear this is the first major character of the mighty revolt of 1857 now this needs certain elaboration here what do we mean when we say the sense of modern nationalism was missing in the mighty revolt of 1857 clear there were five major centers of this revolt and these major centers of this revolt were delhi first of all second major center of this revolt was kanpur adjacent to kanpur the third major center of revolt was lucknow fourth major center of revolt was jhansi in central india and fifth major center of revolt was ara in bihar clear now just understand at delhi the revolt was formally led by mughal emperor bahadur shah zafar clear so first major leader of this revolt in fact was mughal emperor bahadur shah zafar so formal head of revolt at delhi was bahadur shah zafar clear he participated in this revolt just to revive the lost glory of the mughal empire meaning thereby he never wanted to liberate india from british rule his sole objective was to just revive his lost glory in the region of delhi that means he was guided more by regional interest and personal interest rather than by sense of liberating india or rather than the sense of liberating promoting nationalism in india so one major example to show that this revolt lacked sense of modern nationalism was the approach exhibited by mughal emperor bahadur shah zafar clear similarly at kanpur the revolt was led by maratha ruler nana saheb clear what was his major reason for revolt nana saheb wanted increment in the amount of pension clear but since this amount of pension was not revived or enhanced by british nana saheb revolted at kanpur this again indicate that nana saheb was also not influenced by any sense of liberating india from british rule rather he was also largely guided by his personal interest related to increment clear third major center was the center at lucknow where revolt was led by begum hazrat mahal clear she was the wife of nawab wajid ali shah who was rather who died after the annexation of world begum hazrat mahal revolted because she wanted to place her son birji's qadr on the throne of lucknow but awadh had already been annexed by lord dalhousie in the year 1856 this again indicate that her objective was also guided more by personal and regional interest rather than by any sense to liberate india from british rule the fourth major center of revolt was jhansi and at jhansi the revolt was led by a powerful lady rani lakshmi bai clear and she revolted against the british basically to ensure the throne of jhansi for her adopted son but by applying the principle of doctrine of lapse whereby adopted sons could not succeed on the throne lord lord dalhousie had conquered jhansi in 1853 in order to retaliate against this move rani lakshmi bai revolted against the british this again makes it amply clear that she also never wanted to liberate india from british rule she only wanted to ensure the gaddi of jhansi for her son adopted son clear at the same time ara the revolt was led in bihar in the region of ara by old zamindar named as kumar singh he led this revolt in the region of ara and his objective was 
he wanted his zamindari rights ownership rights retained over the village of jagdishpur since british did not accept this idea kumar singh revolted against the british this also demonstrate lack of modern sense of nationalism as he was more influenced by his personal interest all these major storm centers and major leaders who revolted indicate that none of them were guided by any sense of modern nationalism all of them were influenced by personal or parochial interest clear that is why none of them came forward to present a well coordinated plan of action against the british and this itself became a major factor for easy suppression of this mighty revolt of 1857 clear so these major factor makes it clear this major developments makes clear the first major character of this revolt was it lacked the sense of modern nationalism that is why after the suppression of the mighty revolt of 1857 educated indians decided that first india needs to be converted into a nation and they began to arouse nationalism in the second half of 19th century that marked the beginning of the world's longest movement known as the indian national movement clear this is one major character of mighty revolt of 1857 clear at the same time what was the major another major feature or characteristics of the mighty revolt of 1857 clear we'll understand this major characteristic so first was lack of lack lack sense of modern nationalism clear at the same time clear another major factor of a character of this mighty revolt of 1857 was that this revolt was more of backward looking in approach clear so another distinctive feature of this revolt is its backward looking approach now why do historians call this revolt as backward looking approach rather than being marked by forward looking approach the reason are two number one clear in this revolt clear large number of sepoys who want to started this revolt they came to proclaim bahadur shah zafar as the leader of the revolt and ruler of india this indicated that after dislodging british rule even they wanted to continue with medieval system represented by the moguls they never wanted to continue with modern structure of administration being introduced by the british this indicate that it was not a forward looking revolt it was rather a backward looking revolt clear another reason given to justify this nature was during this mighty revolt of 1857 the orthodox sections like the brahmans islamic theologians like the ulemas they proved to be they proved to be leaders and why they wanted to revolt because they never wanted british to introduce modern reforms like abolition of sati widow remarriages in india abolition of slavery clear and that is why they wanted all the people to revolt to dislodge british rule this again indicate that they wanted to continue with medieval and superstitious practices rather than to adopt modern sense of administration and governance clear in on this point also it is said that it was not a forward looking approach revolt rather a backward looking revolt and just because of this major feature only large number of educated indians did not support this revolt and this became another major factor for the suppression of this revolt in fact the nature the character of this revolt itself became major factor for suppression of this revolt by british easily in india so two distinctive character of this revolt was lack of sense of modern nationalism and second was backward looking approach clear and these two factors became major factors for mighty for suppression of this mighty revolt as well so apart from nature related to nature of this revolt a very important indian national leader gave a comment which is asked in our examination in upsc in mains examination clear the question that is asked is related to the statement given by indian leader v d savarkar clear this indian national leader commented in the beginning of 20th century that mighty revolt of 1857 was the first war of indian independence clear now how far it can be accepted we need to go into historiography of the revolt of 1857 first of all we'll break the statement clear first of all we'll understand whether it can be accepted as the first war against british authority and secondly was it a really war of independence against the british clear first of all i'll let you know it was not the first reaction or response of masses against british policies masses had already retaliated against the british 
during in the Rehotwari areas of Bombay and Madras. Not only this, large number of tribals had already retaliated against the British, especially the Santhals. Just before the mighty revolt of 1857, Santhals revolted in the region of Chotanaku Plateau in 1855-56 under the leadership of Siddhu and Kanho. We have to prepare Santhal rebellion especially because right now we have got the first Santhal president of India, the 15th president that is Draupadi Murmo. Clear? The same community revolted against the British in 1856 that led to the creation of Santhal Pargana as a new administrative unit. Clear? All these developments took place and therefore it cannot be said that masses retaliated for the first time. The response of masses in violent form had earlier taken place in Rayotwari areas, in tribal belts and therefore it cannot be considered to be first war against the British. Second part, how far it can be accepted as war of independence? Clear? First of all, we had discussed right now only that this revolt cannot be declared as war of independence because none of the participants, including Mughal Emperor, exhibited any sense of liberating India from British rule. All of them were guided by their personal and regional interests. That is why, just because of lack of modern nationalism, it could be suppressed by British in in a short span of time. Therefore, it can be said that it was neither war of independence, nor first response by masses against British policies. Then what could be the real conclusion? The most valid conclusion related to the character of this revolt has been given by modern historian R.C. Majumdar. According to this historian, the revolt of 1857 was neither first nor national nor war of independence. According to this scholar, it was a spontaneous reaction of masses against British policies in India. This is the most valid thing accepted about the revolt of 1857 that it was a spontaneous reaction of the masses against exploitative policies of British in India. So it cannot be accepted either as war of independence, as national independence or as first reaction of masses in India. It was merely a spontaneous reaction against exploitative policies which could easily be suppressed by British within a short span of time. Okay? Therefore, these were, these were the major characteristics and these are the major nature of comments by leading scholars in India. Several scholars have worked on this like S. N. Sain, who has also made it clear that by the middle of 19th century, India was just a geographical expression and therefore revolt of 1857 was not guided by any sense of modern nationalism. Okay? So, with this character, it can also be analyzed that why the revolt could easily be suppressed. It could easily be suppressed because all the major participants did not present a joint front against the British. So they could be separated or defeated in separate encounters. Moreover, educated Indian class did not support that gave additional benefit for the British to go on for brutal suppression against the masses in India that led to the suppression. Third major factor was it remained confined only to northern and central part of India. It was not a pan-India phenomenon that became additional factor for British to suppress this revolt without much difficulty. Clear? So this revolt came to an end after some time. Clear? Now, how this revolt came to an end after some time, we need to understand that phenomena as well. Clear? Since participants failed to present a collective or joint front, clear? the revolt was ended at different centers by different British officers. These informations are important because it is asked both in your prelims as well as mains examination. Clear? As we had discussed, there were five major centers of this revolt. The first major center was Delhi. And at Delhi, the revolt was suppressed. In fact, Bahadur Shah Zafar was only the nominal head of the revolt. The real person who fought against the British at this, in, at this time was General Bakht Khan. Clear? So General Bakht Khan was a person who fought against British forces at Delhi on behalf of Bahadur Shah Zafar. And at Delhi, the revolt was suppressed by a British officer named as John Nicholson. So John Nicholson suppressed the mighty revolt at Delhi. Clear? So no concerted effort. Separate encounters took place that led to suppression of this revolt at different centers. Clear? Second major center of this revolt was the city of Kanpur. Clear? At Kanpur, the revolt was formally led by the Martha leader Nana Sahib. But actually the fighting of Maratha forces took place under the command of Maratha military general named as 
Tantia Tope. He fought against the British, clear? And at Kanpur, also Kanpur, the revolt was suppressed by Sir Colin Campbell. So another British officer suppressed this revolt and this officer was Sir Colin Campbell. Adjacent to Kanpur, the next major center of revolt was the center of Lucknow. And as we had discussed at Lucknow, the revolt was led by Begum Hazrat Mahal. And here also, the revolt was suppressed by same British officer, Sir Colin Campbell, because both are joining cities and in both the places, Sir Colin Campbell was given the charge to suppress the revolt. Clear? The fourth major center of this revolt was obviously Jhansi, and at Jhansi, the revolt was led by Rani Lakshmi Bai. And at Jhansi, the revolt was suppressed by a British officer, Sir Hug Rose. Clear? This person played a major role in which Rani Jhansi Bai Lakshmi Bai was assassinated. Clear? Fifth major center was the center of Ara in Bihar, where revolt was led by Kumar Singh. And at Ara, the revolt was led by another British officer. And this British officer was Sir William Taylor. He suppressed the revolt at Ara, meaning thereby five distinct officers came forward. They suppressed the revolt at five centers. That also makes it amply clear that coordinated and joint front could not be led by Indian powers and that facilitated British to suppress the revolt in separate encounters within a short span of time. Such informations are asked in prelims examination. They can give you even to match, clear? In fact, Santhal Rebellion that we discussed right now was asked last 2000 prelims examination because that was the most important or immediate precedence of the mighty revolt of 1857, the five major centers of revolt, clear? Now, after the mighty revolt was suppressed, clear? Radical changes were introduced by British in administration. The purpose was to avoid any such revolt in coming time and to sustain British imperialism over India, as India being the most important colony of Britain in the Eastern world, clear? In fact, it was even accepted by national leaders of India like M.A. Ansari. During Madras session of Indian National Congress, M.A. Ansari gave a statement that India is the key stone of British arch of imperialism. So once India gets liberated, all colonies of Britain will crumble down and became in, become independent in course of time. And that happened also after the Second World War. As soon as India became independent, all major countries of Southeast Asia and South Asia became in, independent under the monitoring of United Nations organization. Clear? Now, at the same time, what were the major consequences of the mighty revolt of 1857? So, we'll also discuss about the consequences of this mighty revolt. Clear? First of all, major changes introduced by British after the mighty revolt of 1857. Clear? So, another important thing is consequences or impact of the mighty revolt. We'll understand about the consequences. First of all, as soon as this mighty revolt took place, immediately British Parliament in London, who were sitting as legislators, they realized that British East India Company has lost all legitimate rights to rule over India. So they decided to end the rule of British East India Company immediately. Clear? And in order to end the rule of British East India Company, and to ensure better administration in India to sustain British imperialism, clear? British parliamentarians enacted one of the most comprehensive legislations related to Indian affairs. This comprehensive legislation is known as the Government of India Act 1858, clear? So, Government of India Act 1858 was enacted was enacted by British parliamentarians clear now just understand the provisions of this legislation this is also known as act for better administration in India under the provisions of the government of India act 1858 the rule of British East India Company over India was abolished do remember their political rule over India was abolished, but British East India Company continued to exist for commercial activities in India. Even this corporation exists till contemporary times. So company itself was not abolished, but their political authority were taken away and they could stay back in India only as 
commercial entity at this time, after this time. After taking away the political authority of British East India Company under the Government of India Act 1958, British Crown directly decided to rule over Indian territory. So India passed from company's rule to Crown's rule as per Government of India Act 1858. Clear? So from here, British Crown decided to look after Indian affairs from London. Clear? Since practically it was not possible for British Crown to look after Indian affairs directly, he decided to appoint a member of British cabinet in London to look after Indian affairs. So under Government of India Act 1858, British Crown decided to look after Indian affairs. Clear. British Crown could not look him off the affairs directly. He appointed a member of British Parliament to look after Indian affairs and this person clear, to look after Indian affairs was designated as Secretary of State for India. Clear. Even this Secretary of State for India was to be assisted by 15 other members. Clear. Therefore, Secretary of State for India and 15 members together, they were supposed to monitor Indian affairs and this whole body was termed as the world term does India House in London. Clear? So India House in London was the body to look after Indian affairs as per Government of India Act 1858. Clear? At the same time, to look after Indian affairs within Indian territory, British Crown appointed his direct envoy. This direct envoy appointed by British authority in India came to be designated as Viceroy. Now this title or designation needs to be understood just understand clear as soon as british crown decided to rule over india he made a formal announcement that from now onwards territories will not be annexed by british in india whatever territories has been annexed by british in the company will remain under crown's rule otherwise all other provinces will continue to remain as independent with this announcement, the whole Indian territory got broadly divided into two sections. Clear? One section directly under British Crown came to be known as British India. And at the same time, large number of provinces ruled by native princes of India, they came to be known as princely states. So we need to understand that two sections came into being out of Indian territory. One was to be British India under British Crown. Another was to be large number of princely states under the rule of native rulers of India. Clear? When British Crown was supposed to decide any treaty or tre agreement with princely states, then he was to sign treaty with rulers of princely states. And on behalf of British Crown, this authority of signing treaty agreement was given to Viceroy. So he was designated as Viceroy, a direct representative of British Crown, when he signed any treaty or agreement with rulers of princely states. But in case he looked after general administration of India, he was still designated as Governor General of India. Clear? So same person was given two designations. Clear? One was Viceroy, another was Governor General of India. If the person looked after treaty or agreement on behalf of British Crown, he was to be designated as Viceroy. And when he looked after general administration of British India, he was still to be designated as Governor General of of India. All these changes introduced under Government of India Act 1858 known as Act for Better Administration in India. Clear? At the same time, under Government of India Act 1858, it was made clear that from now onwards, in case incremental changes are to be introduced in Indian administration, there should be separate legislature in India. And under the provisions of this act only, central legislature came into being. So till this time, it was only Governor General's Executive Council that legislated as well as executed the policies. But from now onwards, apart from Governor General's Executive Council, there was to be Central Legislative Council at Calcutta. Laws were to be decided in Legislative Council and executed by Governor General's Executive Council. But one thing must be noted. The Central Legislative Council was to remain merely as advisory bodies, meaning that bar. still all the major powers remain confined with Governor General's Executive Council. Legislative Councils was to remain merely as advisory bodies. Their proposals could either be accepted 
or rejected by the executive council clear at the same time under government of india act 1858 the whole british india was divided into 11 provinces and all these 11 provinces under british crown was further to have governor and his executive council and provincial legislative councils even at provincial level the legislative councils were to act merely as advisory bodies clear so no major powers were given to legislative bodies even at center or at provincial level they were to remain merely as advisory bodies clear these developments took place as a result of the government of india act 1858 so major changes were introduced in indian affairs by this comprehensive legislation apart from changes introduced under this act there were certain changes introduced by british authority on their own in order to prevent the occurrence of any such revolt like the mighty revolt of 1857 clear first of all major changes were introduced in army administration in india since sepoys played a major role to revolt against the british authority clear they were wanted to have better control and monitoring over indian sepoys and therefore the first major change was introduced with respect to military administration and composition in india now what was this change clear the military forces in india or sepoys in india were divided into two categories clear the military or sepoys were divided into martial and non martial categories clear and non martial categories all military indian sepoys who supported british in suppressing the revolt they were declared as martial and they were to be recruited in large numbers and all major military sepoys who did not support british or rather who revolted against the british they were declared to be non martial and they were not to be recruited in large numbers clear for example clear military soldiers from terai region known as the nepali soldiers the garhwal soldiers they supported british in suppressing the revolt even six soldiers they supported british in suppressing the revolt they were declared to be the martial forces clear so like the forces or garhwali forces as well as the sikh forces they supported british and they were declared to be martial clear martial at the same time non martial were military soldiers from gangetic plain clear they largely revolted against the british clear like awadh and therefore they were declared to be they were declared to be non martial and they were not to be recruited in large numbers clear large numbers this was the major change introduced by british in martial administration moreover in the provinces like bengal which was very sensitive in nature it was decided to increase the proportion of european soldiers in context of indian soldiers so more number of european officers were to be posted to have a complete change of indian soldiers so that such revolt like mighty revolt of 1857 may not take place in coming time this was one change another major change was british administration became highly reactionary thereafter in order to prohibit the free expression of opinion as well as views among indian leaders or indian masses british began to restrict freedom of press in india and in order to stop the freedom of press in india especially in regional languages or vernacular languages british authority headed by reactionary governor general lord lytton clear he proved to be highly reactionary in nature and lord lytton enacted a very reactionary legislation known as the vernacular press act clear this vernacular press act was enacted in the year 1878 clear the purpose of this legislation was to check the publication of regional papers in india that was meant to arouse awareness among indian masses clear it was also declared to be a gagging act a black act by indian leaders clear the purpose rather under the provisions of this act it was made clear that any na- regional newspaper and publishing house before publishing anything must submit the publishing material before the district magistrate apart from this certain security amount was to be given to district magistrate and in case anything was published which went against the british the security amount as well as the press materials were to be confiscated by the district magistrate meaning thereby all freedom of expression through newspapers and journals 
were to be prohibited. Clear? Primarily, this legislation was enacted to target one regional newspaper in India or in Bengal, and this paper was Amrit Bazar Patrika. Clear? This Amrit Bazar Patrika was published from Calcutta by persons like Anand Surendranath Banerjee and Anand Mohan Bose. And since it began to create awareness among masses, British wanted to stop its publication. But the publisher of this paper proved to be proved to be highly smart and within overnight after the enactment of this legislation they converted or translated this paper into English newspaper and therefore provisions of vernacular press act could not be applied on Amrit Bazar Patrika. They syndicate several educated Indians came to forefront by this time and they really wanted to arouse awareness among Indian masses. Clear? Another major consequence of mighty revolt of 1857 was that no British realized that the prime movers of this mighty revolt were Muslim leaders and rulers in India. In order to create religious divide among masses in India, British authorities started the game of divide and rule. Clear? And therefore, they realized that it is better to appease the Muslim communities or dominant minority communities in India. Clear? That is why in the year 1870, a British literary expert, W. W. Hunter, wrote an important work in known, entitled as Indian Muslim. Clear? And when this work was written, titled as Indian Muslim, clear? he highlighted that Muslims were not only a community, their political and social interests are quite distinct from other communities that needs to be safeguarded separately. From here, sense of divide along religious lines began to be created by British because they knew if dominant minority community is secluded, obviously the rising awareness may not prove to be a challenge for British. And therefore from here, communalism along religious lines began to be promoted by British with publication of Indian Muslim. And they went forward with this idea when they decided to divide the most active province of Bengal in 1905 along religious lines. And moreover, further to appease the minority communities, they came up with the principle of separate electorates in the Morley Minto reforms of 1909 that took the form of Indian Councils Act of 1909. Clear? So all these were major changes introduced as a consequence of mighty revolt of 1857 as they wanted to avoid any such revolt to maintain prestige of British crown. It must be noted clear, that since British crown was the most respected person all across the world at this time, his prestige was to be maintained to sustain British imperialism not only over India, but over Asia and Africa at large. Clear? So just to maintain the prestige of British crown, such revolt or rebellion like the mighty revolt of 1857 was to be avoided by appeasing the Muslim masses or by creating the sense of divide among masses along religious lines or by rather restricting the freedom of press and opinion in India. Clear? But all such efforts could not lead to major results. Political awareness and, con awareness and consciousness continued to take place and ultimately the national leaders of India established a national body known as Indian National Congress that started a long struggle towards India's liberation till the middle of the 20th century. Clear? So this was an important topic of modern Indian history that is the mighty revolt of 1857 clear so first of all i'll let you know that if you, while preparing any topic you need to be very clear with respect to its structure once the structure is clear you will have mastery over the topic clear so first of all we had discussed about the major reasons that led to mighty revolt of 1857 then we discussed about the major characteristics of this revolt because related to nature of character there is the debate among scholars we have discussed some major debates also then we had discussed about the reasons that led to the suppression of this revolt which were embedded in its characteristic and lastly we had discussed about the major consequences of the mighty revolt of 1857. So with respect to any topic, you need to prepare three important things that is the background or the reasons, then the progress or the nature and then finally the consequences. Once you are prepared with all these things, it means you have completed the topic and you are ready 
for both mains as well as prelims examination you can write any answer on any question asked in mains and you can attempt any objective question asked in preliminary examination clear in fact we follow such a strategy in our gs courses thoroughly and we'll be doing it when we are starting our new batch from september 2022 clear in fact not only sessions we also believe in engaging the students in pre class sessions as well as in post class sessions as well and this idea of engaging the students not only in formal classes but also before classes and after classes is an idea given by our director and mentor mr shabir sir who has been teaching in this field for almost more than two decades clear and since he's a well known teacher in upsc for upsc examination he has drafted the whole course scientifically and all the methods adopted by him are purely scientific in fact he has in his kt a saw large number of students who have got through upsc got through in upsc with flying colors and good ranks clear so he will be taking some important sections in gs like geography and essay for which he is known all across india clear and under his guidance we have drafted a very well designed for for your gs it is based on module teaching also it is based on paper wise teaching as well as well as it is based on foundational criteria because we want to bring some foundational or we want to work on your foundation so that gs becomes a strong area of the students engaged with us so that they can face this examination with huge amount of confidence clear so he will be launching our courses both in terms of module wise as well as in terms of paper wise and as well as comprehensively through foundation course as well clear so all of us you are invited to enjoy and to learn with the learners journey that we have started to build up and in this learners journey journey we will explore ups examination we'll explore the general studies all together and therefore a new concept will be witnessed by all of you with respect to pre and post class engagements apart from formal classes clear so hope to see you soon and all the best to all of you thank you